Hi, how are you doing? Right, today, sciatic nerve, sciatic nerve. Um, the biggest nerve in the body, it's just a big, it's a real big chunky one, um, and causes people pain sometimes when stuff doesn't work so well. But what we'll try and do is work out why it causes so many people pain and how the pattern of pain re relates to um, where the nerve runs and its job. So where does it come from? Where does it go to? What does it do? That's about it, right? For any nerve in the body? Okay. And I'll try to describe the anatomy of the sciatic nerve fully, but briefly. But we'll look at it visually. There's a challenge. So I might not talk about every single little nuance, but you should have a good understanding of the nerve by the end. So it's a nerve of the lumbosacral plexus. So it's a nerve from down here. Here are the lumbar vertebrae. Here's the sacrum down there. These are <clears throat> blood vessels I probably made in the previous video, I think. Um, and the lumbosacral plexus is formed by spinal nerves coming out from between the vertebrae in the lumbar levels and uh, spinal nerves coming out through these holes, these foramina from the sacrum. Those spinal nerves come together, meet, separate up, meet, join and form other nerves and those other nerves largely run into the lower limb. The sciatic nerve is the biggest example of that. Now, that's what we're looking at here. So those lumbar vertebrae and the lumbosacral plexus and the biggest nerve of the lot here, double coloured on this side, single colour on that side, huge great big nerve because it's got a massive job to do or a series of massive jobs to do. And a nerve that big must be made up of more neurons than other nerves. So a nerve is a collection of axons, bundles of axons of nerves or nerve fibres running out of different parts of the body. And the, sci the sciatic nerve is formed from a number of roots. So we can see spinal nerves coming out from between vertebrae. These spinal nerves are coming out from the spinal cord and strictly speaking this is the ventral ramus of a spinal nerve. Um, that might be helpful for some of you and not for others. We name the spinal nerves down here uh, by numbers and inferior to the the vertebra that they pop out between. So the L3 spinal nerve is popping out from between the L3 and L4 lumbar vertebrae. And the sciatic nerve is made up of the ventral rami from spinal nerves L4, L5, S1, S2 and S3. And look, there they are, they're all coming together to form this massive nerve. That is a lot of neurons. And it's a mixed nerve, so it has motor jobs, it's going to innovate muscles, and sensory jobs. It's going to carry sensory information back, largely from the skin. And you can see, well kind of, that it's, <laughs> these are the, the hip bones here. So they're running up along the is ischium, or ischium, here. That's how it gets its name. Ischion is an ancient Greek word for hip joint and hip. Um, Ischium is the bone, the sciatic nerve runs along, runs over the bone, so it gets called the sciatic nerve. Maybe, I think so, possibly. Anyway, that's, it's got the same sounds in there. That's where the name comes from, this, from the sciatic nerve. So then, with all of those roots, that, I mean, this region of the body is, is pretty well protected. Um, the most vulnerable bit, really, are the vertebrae themselves. The sacrum, well these bones all fused a long time ago, so those are pretty safe, but it's the lumbar vertebrae. The lumbar vertebrae have really big bodies, and the reason they're so big is because they've got to take all of the weight above them. So these are the vertebrae that have to take a big load, which means that, because they're taking that load, they are more likely to be damaged by poor lifting, twisting, you know, extreme loads. And between the vertebrae we have these intervertebral discs, and if these get compressed, the centre of the disc is most likely to herniate out posteriorly and posterolaterally because of some other anatomy around here. Which means that the roots of the sciatic nerve can be affected by a herniating intervertebral disc, 
or other uh, pathologies, injuries, damage to the, the lumbar vertebrae down here because that root, that spinal nerve root, doesn't have a lot of room between the bones to come out through. So any little changes anatomically to that region, if they compress the nerve, they can cause problems. Of course, that problem is often described as sciatica. Now, you know what it's like when you compress a nerve, because if you bang your funny bone, you get the shooting pain along your arm, right? If the roots of the sciatic nerve are being affected in some way, that could lead to an ache, a mild ache, uh, something very painful, something in between. It could lead to numbness in the regions innervated by that nerve. It could lead to weakness in the muscles innervated by that nerve. So most of the problems of the sciatic nerve come back to the roots of the sciatic nerve and where they come out of the spinal cord and out through between the vertebrae. So those L4 and L5 roots uh, are most likely to be affected. All right. If you are a medical student or other health professional student and you get to look at the sciatic nerve in a real person, a cadaver or something like that, take a look. It really is very, very big. Um, that's not a bad approximation. Often I see it even bigger than that, but it is a very, very big nerve. Um, okay, and it's gonna run into like, the posterior, so the gluteal region and then into the lower limb. Let's see how it does that then. So the sciatic nerve then forms largely anterior to the ischium and then it's got to get to the gluteal region. It's going to get posteriorly and it's going to do that through here. So this, there's a little bit of a, a, little bit of a gap there. This is the, this is the greater sciatic foramen. On this skeleton we can see there's just a bony curve but in life there are some ligaments um, linking the, the pelvic bones to the sacrum, and that creates a hole, the greater sciatic foramen. So the sacrum, the, sorry, so the sciatic nerve, boop, goes out through the greater sciatic foramen, and then it's into the gluteal region. The gluteal region. So this is a, whoop. There's the big toe. This is a left leg. So there's the, there's the gluteal region there. So we would expect then, if we take off gluteus maximus, to find the sciatic nerve. There it is. Now on this model, it's, it looks a much, much smaller than we saw on the other model. The sciatic nerve is a lot bigger than this. But there it is, you take off gluteus maximus and there's the sciatic nerve. Now, do you notice that it is inferior? So if you were to give somebody an intramuscular gluteal injection, the safe place to do that would be up here, superior and lateral, well away from the sciatic nerve down there. It is a really, really big nerve. If you were to put the needle through the muscle, you got a really good chance of hitting that nerve and you never want to put a needle into a nerve because, well, it's a nerve that would hurt and, you know, it would damage it. So the anatomical location of the sciatic nerve in the gluteal region is important. All right, take gluteus maximus off. The muscle here, and this is actually what sparked this video because this was an exam question, the muscle here is piriformis. It's one of the lateral rotators of the hip. All of these little muscles down here are lateral rotators of the femur at the hip joint. And piriformis is a good landmark. It's, that literally means the pear-shaped muscle. Uh, the sciatic nerve almost always appears inferior to the piriformis muscle and then runs down into the posterior thigh. Sometimes we see the sciatic nerve or part of the sciatic nerve actually passing through the piriformis muscle and part of it passing inferior to the piriformis muscle. This means in people that use their piriformis muscles a lot, athletes, and have part of their sciatic nerve running through the muscle, the use of that muscle, and probably the hypertrophy of that muscle, can then irritate part of the sciatic nerve. It's not common, but it happens. Um, I can't think of, uh, I don't remember if I've seen it in any dissections I've done or not, but that's the landmark. So the other important thing here is, here's the sciatic nerve. These are the lateral rotators of the hip and we saw the gluteal muscles. It doesn't innervate any of those muscles. It does not innervate 
gluteus maximus, medius, or minimus, and it does not innervate the lateral rotators of the hip. It doesn't innervate piriformis. They each have their own little nerve, those guys, those little lateral rotators, and the cluteal muscles have got their own nerves as well. So it hasn't really started doing anything yet. But then it descends into the posterior thigh, and that's it. Now it starts working. It innervates the muscles of the posterior thigh and carries sensory innervation back from the skin of the posterior thigh. So the muscles here are biceps femoris, semitendinosus, and semimembranosus. If I take those off, you can see that the sciatic nerve runs deep to those hamstring muscles of the posterior thigh and innervates them as it goes past. It also innervates adductor magnus, the big adductor muscle, a little bit, but the adductor muscles are largely innervated by another nerve. Now, do you see, as it descends, it splits into two. When I'm dissecting this region, in different cadavers, I will find the sciatic nerve splitting into two at different points, but it will separate into two nerves at some point in the posterior thigh. The sense I get is, is that these two parts are actually held together by connective tissue, and you can kind of tease them apart if you're dissecting to a higher point than it appears as if they actually separate from. So a nerve is a bundle of neurons and bundles within bundles. And that's what we're seeing here. So the sciatic nerve, as it descends to the posterior thigh, splits into the tibial nerve and the common fibular nerve, also known as the common peroneal nerve. It's got an O in the middle there. If you were to mix that up and say common perineal nerve or perineal nerve, you'd be you'd be in the wrong region, you'd be up here. Perineal nerves are in the perineum, right? So I tend to say to my students, use the word fibula. It's easier to remember. The anatomy makes more sense and you're not gonna make that little mistake. So the sciatic nerve splits into tibial and common fibular nerves. Now, where do they go and what do they do? All right, well, we are, there's the, there's the knee. Posterior to the knee is the popliteal region. And you can see the tibial nerve runs through the popliteal region with the popliteal blood vessels. And now I'm going to need to dissect. What we see here, this is the, uh, there's the, the foot, there's the big toe. So we're looking posteriorly. This is the calf. These are the calf muscles. So I need to take off gastrocnemius and soleus and plantaris probably. Take, take these off. And you can see where the tibial nerve runs. It runs deep to those superficial big muscles of the calf. Remember, these are big muscles because they are involved in moving our entire body weight. So we take those guys off and we see the tibial nerve descends through the calf or through the posterior leg from the knee to the ankle. It's going to innervate the muscles of the calf and it's also going to innervate these deep muscles of the calf in here as well. So it has that motor job to do. And then as it gets to the ankle, look, so, oh, there's the big toe. So this is medial. It's going to run around the ankle here into the plantar surface, so the sole of the foot, and it's going to give off medial and lateral plantar nerves. The, the tunnel is running around through here to get to the foot is called the tarsal tunnel. So the tibial nerve innervates all of the muscles of the calf, superficial and deep, runs through the tarsal tunnel to the plantar surface of the foot divides into medial and lateral plantar nerves will innervate all of the plantar intrinsic muscles of the foot that is the little muscles inside the foot and carry sensory innervation back from that region too all right now in the leg that is the part of the body between the knee and the ankle we have three compartments we've already talked about one compartment the posterior compartment uh, so there is also an anterior compartment, the muscles of your shin. Look how the, uh, the tibia here is, 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 is quite um, close to the skin. You can feel your, your tibia, your shin. So these muscles here are in the anterior compartment of the leg. And then we have a lateral compartment here. Why am I telling you this? Well, I, I love this intricate anatomy, but it's very difficult to remember. We saw the common fibular nerve running laterally to run around here. This here, so there's a, there's a bony point out here, right? This is the, there's the knee. 
So laterally here, you can palpate on yourself a bony lump, and that bony lump is the head of the fibula bone. The fibula is lateral, the slender bone, the tibia is the big chunky bone, um, which you can feel anteriorly. So the common fibula nerve runs laterally to the head of the fibula bone, and then it divides into two which is why we call it the common fibula nerve, because it's going to split. And it divides into the deep and superficial fibula nerves. Now, the superficial fibula nerve stays superficial. So it stays in this lateral compartment and it innervates fibularis longus and fibularis brevis muscles. All right, so out here. Now, the deep fibula nerve it's going to run to the anterior compartment, but it has to go a little deep to get there. I know, it's not, it's not the most brilliant and bulletproof way of remembering it, but anyway. Right, so the common fibular nerve gives off the deep fibular nerve. The deep fibular nerve is going to run into the anterior compartment, so it has to run between some deeper structures to get there. And it's going to innervate the muscles of the, of the shin of the anterior leg. And that's what we're seeing in there. So it's going to innervate the anterior muscles of the leg. That is, the muscles that are going to dorsiflex the foot. That is, bring the foot towards the shin. So you've got like tibialis anterior in there and things like that. Sounds like playtime has kicked off at the crash. Literally. That's not a euphemism for anything. It's just literally there's a crash there and I think the kids have... Anyway. Right, so... Deep fibular nerve, superficial fibular nerve. Okay, and the common fibular nerve is also going to carry some sensation back from the skin of the lateral knee. Um, right, so the, we haven't finished yet. There's a couple more things to think about. The deep fibular nerve continues into the dorsum of the foot. This is the dorsum of the foot. This is the plantar foot. So the deep fibular nerve continues into the dorsum of the foot and it does two things. It runs to the skin of the web space between the first toe and the second toe. And it innervates the intrinsic muscles of the dorsum of the foot. These are the ones that are going to lift the toes up. So extensor, uh, digiti, um, extensor digitorum brevis and extensor hallucis brevis. All right, and then that's it, it's done. All right, so if the superficial fibular nerve carries sensation from the skin over the lateral compartment, and the deep fibular nerve is carrying sensation from the skin over the anterior compartment, uh, and we've talked about uh, the sciatic nerve carrying sensory innervation back from the skin over the posterior thigh, there's one region we haven't talked about yet in terms of sensory stuff. We've talked about the foot as well, right, with the, with the plantar nerves. So, there is another nerve, the sural nerve. Now, the sural nerve is formed by, it's formed from branches of the tibial nerve and the common fibular nerve that come together. So, we kind of have medial and lateral parts. And those nerves come together to form a sural nerve a superficial nerve of the posterior calf that carries sensory innervation back from part of the skin of the calf and part of the foot. So the sural nerve is also part of the sciatic nerve. Okay, so uh, we have traced the sciatic nerve and talked about its branches and the, the regions that it supplies in a somewhat brief manner. There is more detail to this if we, if we chose to add more detail. But can you now think of a, an even more brief way of describing what the sciatic nerve does? And this is the way I normally describe it to students. I say the sciatic nerve innervates the posterior compartment of the thigh and everything distal to the knee. That's the sciatic nerve. And its roots are L4, L5, S1, S2, S3, which is why problems at L4 and L5 can cause problems with the sciatic nerve. The other fun bit is, of course, piriformis and the greater sciatic foramen. But 
it's the biggest nerve in the body because it has a lot of muscle to innervate and quite a bit of skin. It's got a lot of work to do. If a nerve, you know, has to do a lot of stuff, it's, it's big. And you're getting off topic again. But that is the sciatic nerve. That's the anatomy of the sciatic nerve in a nutshell. Um, and if you've read about or suffered from sciatica, that's why damage to the, or compression of the roots up here causes shooting pains or numbness or tingling or weakness through these parts of the lower limb because those axons are running down to these parts of the lower limb and because they're compressed up here, that could be the same as compressing that nerve in else other parts of the leg as well. It feels like the problem's in the leg, but actually the problem's up here. Okay, that's enough sciatic nerve. The femoral nerve <laughs> innervates the anterior compartment of the thigh. We'll do that one day as well. Right, see you next week. I will stop talking now. <laughs>